you will hear a number of different recordings and you'll have to answer questions on what you hear. There will be time for you to read the instructions and questions and you'll have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given 10 minutes to transfer your answers to an answer sheet. Now turn to section 1. Section 1. You will hear a conversation between an international student and the accommodation department. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 1 to 3. Hello, Accommodation Department. How can I help you? Uh, do you look after accommodation for international students? Yes, uh, we look after accommodation for all the students. Good. I hope you can help me then. I've only just been accepted onto a postgraduate course and I want to know if there is any accommodation available from this September. I know it's very short notice. Mm, yes, uh, it, it is rather late, but I'm sure we'll be able to find you something. Uh, first of all, can you give me your name and student number so that I can find you on the system? Sure. My name is Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Maria Teresa Gonzalez. Uh, how do you spell that? G-O-N-Z-A-L-E-Z. -E Thank you. Got it. And your student number, please? S H U three zero zero. 715PG. SHU 300715PG. Ah, here you are. Department of Modern Languages. Yes, that's me. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 4 to 7. OK, now there are several options for postgraduate students. Firstly, there is the Trigon. Uh, this is a new block near to the station and not far from the main campus. Accommodation is what we call cluster accommodation. What does that mean? Uh, there's a small group of rooms, usually six, each with its own bathroom clustered around a lounge kitchen area which is shared. Oh, I see. That sounds good. They are very popular. Uh, the price for these is £99 per week and we do have some availability left. However, for postgraduate students, there are other options. And what are they? Uh, there's another apartment block called The Cube located near the west gate of the campus. Accommodation there is in one or two bedroom self-contained flats. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 8 to 10. So the cube is self-contained? How does that work? Well, basically, they're just like ordinary apartments. Each apartment has one or two study bedrooms with ensuite bathroom, a lounge and a kitchen. And what is the price of those? Uh, for the one bedroom, it is £180 per week. And for the two bedroom, it is £110 per week for each person. And can I choose who I share with? If you have a friend and you would like to share with them, of course, we can reserve a two bedroom apartment for you both. Otherwise, you just have to share with whoever else is there. Uh, obviously, it will be another woman. Mm. I will have to think about this. 
Do I have to make a decision now? No, but we don't have much accommodation left, so I can't guarantee that there will still be availability if you leave it too long. Yes, that's fair. I have a friend in the management department who might like to share. I will speak with her and get back to you this afternoon. OK, fine.、Uh, do let us know as soon as you can. I will do. Thanks for all your help. My pleasure. Bye. Bye. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a podcast about an area called the sheep market in a New Zealand city. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fourteen. Now listen carefully and answer questions eleven to fourteen. Welcome to this podcast about the sheep market, which is one of the oldest parts of the city. As its name suggests, there was originally a market here where farmers brought their sheep, but now it's been redeveloped into a buzzing, vibrant area of the city, which is also home to one of the city's fastest-growing communities. The nearby university has always meant the area is popular with students who come in to enjoy the lively nightlife, but now graduates embarking on careers in the worlds of fashion and design are buying up the new apartments recently built here to replace the small houses where the market workers used to live. The narrow old side streets are great places for finding original pictures, jewellery, and ceramics which won't break the bank, as well as local produce like fruit and vegetables. There's also lots of pavement cafes where you can have a coffee and watch tourists from all over the world go by. The oldest buildings in the area are on the main streets, including the city's first department store, built in the 1880s, which is still open today. The sheep market is a centre for fashion, and there's a policy of encouraging new young designers. The young fashion competition is open to local young people who are passionate about fashion. This year, they've been asked to design an outfit based on ideas from the music and technology that's part of their everyday life, using both natural and man-made fibres. The garments will be judged by a panel of experts and fashion designers, and the winning entries will be modelled at a special gala evening. Parking at the sheep market is easy. There are plenty of pay and display car parking spaces on the roadsides, which are fine if you just want to stay for an hour or two. But if you want to spend the day there, it's better to park in one of the four underground car parks. It's not expensive, and if you can present a receipt from one of the local stores, you'll not be charged at all. After 6 p.m., many of the car parks have a flat rate which varies, but it is usually very reasonable. Before you hear the rest of the podcast, you have some time to look at questions 15 to 20. Now listen, and answer questions fifteen to twenty. The sheep market is one of the main centres for art and history in the whole of the country. If you look at our map, you'll see some of the main attractions there. Most visitors start from Crawley Road at the bottom of the map. 
The Reynolds House is one of the oldest houses in the city and is open to the public. It's on the north side of Crawley Road, next to the footpath that leads to the public gardens. The area is particularly interesting for its unusual sculptures. The thumb is just what its name suggests, but it's about 10 metres high. You'll see it on Hill Road, across the road from the bank. The museum's got a particularly fine collection of New Zealand landscapes. It's on the east side of the sheep market, on City Road. It's on the other side of the road from the public gardens, immediately facing the junction with Hill Road. The Contemporary Art Gallery is on a little road that leads off Station Square, not far from the public gardens. The road ends at the gallery. It doesn't go anywhere else. That's open every day, except Mondays. The Warner Gallery specialises in 19th century art. It's on City Road, near the junction with Crawley Road, on the same side of the road as the public gardens. It's open on weekdays from 9 to 5, and entry is free. Finally, if you're interested in purchasing high-quality artwork, the place to go is Nucleus. You need to go from Crawley Road up through Station Square and east along Hill Road until you get to a small winding road turning off. Go up there and it's on your right. If you get to City Road, you've gone too far. That is the end of Section 2. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a conversation between two students who will discuss a project they're working on together. You have 30 seconds to look at questions 21 to 27. Hey Jess, glad you could make it. We've got a lot to discuss. Hi Matt. Yes, sorry I'm a bit late. I did bring all my notes with me. Yes, me too. Where shall we start? Well, I think it would be a good idea to clarify our objectives just one more time. Yes, good idea. Okay, here we are. We need to record, photograph and identify the plant species in 10 one square meter plots. Does it say anything about where these plots should be and how they should be laid out? Ah, here it is. It says that all the plots need to be no more than 10 meters apart. And how do we choose them? Ah, this is the fun part. I remember this. Here we are. Make a one meter square frame using bamboo sticks available from the department stores. Yes, we've, we've already done that. I know, I'm just reading the whole section. Okay. One person stands roughly in the middle of the chosen area and throws the frame. The other person uses a tape to mark out the square where the frame landed and returns frame to thrower. The thrower then turns a few degrees on the spot and throws again. The thrower must turn slightly after each throw and vary the force of the throw until after the tenth throw they are pointing in almost the same direction as the first. That sounds a bit complicated. That's only because it's all in writing. It's just a simple throw, turn, throw, turn, throw, turn, until we have ten squares. And I guess you want to do the throwing. Well, if you don't mind. I'm sure you'll be more accurate at marking the squares. Yes, I'm sure I am. And I'm sure you've got a stronger throwing arm. You now have 30 seconds to look at questions 28 to 30.
Okay, good. We've got that sorted. Now we need to decide where to go. Yes, I've been thinking about that and I've brought the map. Ah, well done. I forgot mine. Now, I've identified three possible locations, but they've all got some disadvantages. Okay, fire away. Well, the area around this lowland marsh could be interesting. There'll be a lot of interesting water plants here. Looks good, but what's the problem? Mainly that it's already a designated nature reserve, and I think there's already been a lot of research done here. Ah, I see. Well, I'd rather do something that's new and can be useful. I agree. That's why I identified this area further west. See, here, behind the beach. Oh yes, I see. That area there, where it's flat, but quite high. Exactly. If you look a bit further inland, you'll see that there are hills which will protect that area from strong north winds. I see. Excellent. But what's the problem? Just that it may not be very interesting. We know that the geology there is not conducive to a wide variety of plants. Mmm, I agree. So what's your last idea? Well, I think this one is a bit of a winner, although I did want to show you the other two. Look up here, on the north coast. Where? See, this bay? Well, I know that there's been quite a lot of studies done here, but a bit further to the east, behind this headland. No one has ever looked at that. Well, I certainly couldn't see any studies. That is interesting. And the plant life could be a bit different because of the shelter from the wind the headland provides. Exactly. Brilliant, Jessica. That's a great idea. We'll go there. Thanks. Now all we have to decide is when is a good time. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a lecture about noise in cities. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. This lecture will be about the science of acoustics, the study of sound, in relation to urban environments such as cities. As an acoustic engineer myself, I think this is an area where we're likely to see great changes. In the past, researching urban soundscapes was simple. We measured levels of sound in decibels, so I used to take my sound meter and I measured the noise somewhere, and then I might ask a sample of people to say at what level the sound became annoying. With data like this, acoustic engineers have been able to build up what we call noise maps, maps of the sound environment. But actually, these aren't a lot of use. What they do show is that the highest noise levels are generally on roads. Well, that's not really very surprising. But there's quite a lot going on that these maps don't show, because they can't capture the complex way that sound varies over time. So they ignore important issues such as the noise someone might hear from the open windows or gardens of their neighbours. And this sort of noise can be quite significant in summer. We don't have any databases on this sort of information. As well as that, these records of sound levels take no account of the fact that people vary in their perceptions of noise. 
So someone like me with years of working in acoustics might be very different from you in that regard. But anyway, even though these noise maps are fairly crude, they've been useful in providing information and raising awareness that noise matters. We need to deal with it. And so it's a political matter. And that's important. We need rules and regulations because noise can cause all sorts of problems. Those of you who are city dwellers know that things go on 24 hours a day, so city dwellers often suffer from interrupted sleep. It's also known that noise can lead to a rise in levels of stress due to physical changes in the body affecting the composition of the blood. And there are other problems as well. For instance, if schoolchildren don't have a quiet place to study, their work will suffer. Now, one problem with decibel measurement is that it doesn't differentiate between different types of noise. Some types of sounds that most people would probably think of as nice and relaxing might well score quite highly in decibel levels. Think of the sound made by a fountain in a town square, for example. That's not necessarily something that we'd want to control or reduce. So maybe researchers should consider these sorts of sounds in urban design. This is going to be tricky, because just measuring decibel levels isn't going to help us here. Instead, many researchers are using social science techniques, studying people's emotional response to sound by using questionnaires and so on. So what exactly do people want to hear in an urban environment? Some recent interdisciplinary research has come out with results that at first sight seem contradictory. A city needs to have a sense of activity, so it needs to be lively, with sounds like the clack of high heels on a pavement or the hiss of a coffee machine. But these mustn't be too intrusive, because at the same time we need to be able to relax. One of the major problems in achieving this will be getting architects and town planners to use the research. Apart from studying the basics of acoustics, these people receive very little training in this area. But in fact, they should be regarding sound as an opportunity to add to the experience of urban living, whereas at present they tend to see it as something to be avoided or reduced as far as possible, or something that's just a job for engineers, like the street drainage system. What's needed is for noise in cities to be regarded as an aesthetic quality, as something that has the qualities of an art form. If we acknowledge this, then we urgently need to know what governs it and how designers can work with it. We need to develop a complex understanding of many factors. What is the relationship between sound and culture? What can we learn from disciplines such as psychology about the way that sound interacts with human development and social relationships, and the way that sound affects our thoughts and feelings? Can we learn anything from physics about the nature of sound itself? Today's powerful technologies can also help us. To show us their ideas and help us to imagine the effect their buildings will have, Architects and town planners already use virtual reality, but these programs are silent. In the future, such programs could use realistic sounds, meaning that soundscapes could be explored before being built. So hopefully, using the best technology we can lay our hands on, the city of the future will be a pleasure to the ears as well as the eyes. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Mm -hmm.